cannot wait. So, it's technology is interesting, right? Uh, what what we just saw was a little kind of social experiment that's done, where they have someone kind of swipe left or swipe right uh, in person to kind of show uh, the the gravity behind what happens. You know, when somebody is on a on a dating app, right? Now, me coming up, dating was a little bit different, right? Does anybody remember? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I like you. Do you like me? I loaded the deck a little bit. It says, yes or yes. All right? So, you know, technology has kind of changed the game a little bit when we think about uh, being able to connect or make connection with people. Like, we've lowered our barriers to entry and dating in many ways while rising the certainty of rejection. Isn't that something? That we've lowered the barrier to entry. At any time, you can pull up a phone or get on a computer or whatever and connect. But at the same time, we've also upped the stakes in being able to reject people as well. There's this term by which our message series gets its name called ghosting. And it's simply this. It's when one person stops communicating with the other person without any explanation. Right? Now, some of us, if it hasn't been in dating, maybe you've been in a a conversation with a friend, right? Right? Some of us, we have those friends where you'll send them a text and you'll see it come up as red, but they don't respond for like a day later. Anybody been there? Now, for those of us that are in leadership, we know that this is a, is a reality sometimes, right? When we're looking for people to, you know, work in the, the, the army of the Lord and we send a text and then we see it's red. Days later, we, we may get a response, all right? But the City of Light Church isn't really like that, though. Those are those, those other places. But consider, consider this. In 2016, there was uh, some research done, and it said 78% of single millennials at le- uh, admit to being ghosted at least once. 78% have been ghosted at least once. Now, when we break down this this word ghosting, it has hiding in it some more detrimental concepts, right? Two words that we're going to explore during this message series that I believe God is going to give us the victory over. Two words, rejection and abandonment. Now, ghosting someone is abandonment or rejection with no explanation. Now, when we consider the causes of emotional abandonment, they are many. Different things could have us feeling as if, number one, we're rejected or we've been abandoned. Sometimes in in any relationship, when someone decides that they're going to stop communicating with us or they withhold affection or love or care or concern, that many times will set off or trigger us feeling rejected or abandoned. Sometimes for those that are parents, and for us that are parents, we know that the demand for our time, the demand for our effort, the demand for our focus can be extremely high sometimes. But sometimes when that that child doesn't reciprocate, or sometimes when that spouse doesn't reciprocate, we can really feel abandoned. Sometimes we can feel emotionally abandoned or rejected, even when it's not the other person's fault. Sometimes there could be someone that we have loved and been close to, and due to an illness or something else, we've lost that person. You know, for me, I remember early on, and I'm going to kind of sit on the, uh, the psychiatrist's couch for a minute, proverbially speaking. I remember early on my great uncle who was like a father to me. 
You know, I was born in Ohio, didn't come to Milwaukee until I was six years old. And I remember just about every single day of my life because it was a side-by-side townhouse and my great uh, uncle and aunt stayed next to us. And I would be over there all of the time. And I mean, my uncle was, was so great. He was a hunter. He cared about his children. He cared about myself and my brother and my mom and was really just a loving individual. But one day, he got sick. And I remember that day distinctly when the call came, because at this time we had moved to Milwaukee, and he was still uh, in Ohio. I remember when the call came. The call came, and my mom told me that, you know what, your uncle, he didn't make it. And I remember at that time as a little boy, feeling abandoned and really feeling rejected. So much so, and I didn't realize it until later on in my teen years and even in my adulthood that I had begun to build up walls in my heart for certain people so that I did not experience that feeling of rejection or abandonment ever again in my life. And that showed up sometimes in how I love. That showed up sometimes in the friendships that I had, that I would only take those friendships so far, but they really wouldn't see the deep down person whom I really was. And so with that, sometimes illness or loss of a loved one can cause the feeling of emotional abandonment. Sometimes unresolved resentment for others as well. When you haven't forgiven, sometimes that can set up walls in your heart so that those that are on the outside that really want to love you find it impenetrable to really get to your heart. Some of the things that can increase this feeling of abandonment or rejection, one of them is neglect. As a matter of fact, there was a study that was done uh, by the Institute of uh, Childhood, uh, childhood development. And in this study, they show where kids that grew up maybe in uh, the system or institutions because they did not have parents that were around, that those kids would have this characteristic about themselves, many would, of being overtly friendly, where sometimes it would be they would be closed off, But then other times, see, to a perfect stranger would run up and give them a hug and would run up and really just show them these signs of affection because they were dealing with that sense of abandonment and because all of us want to be connected, because all of us want to be loved. Sometimes, especially as those those children, they don't know how to navigate that. So emotions many times are thrown off kilter. But for some of us here today, we might be older, we might be adults, but some of us here today are still dealing with hurts and wounds and feelings of rejection and abandonment that started much younger in our lives. So how do we navigate that? How do we have healthy relationships How do we set ourselves up for success so that we're not hamstringing our success or hamstringing the purpose that God has created us for? Well, I'm glad that you are here today and that you'll be here for this series because we are going to dive deep into this over these next four weeks. And I believe that God is going to bring us some serious deliverance. I believe that God is going to bring us some serious healing so that we can experience relationships in a healthy way and see the glory of God in our lives. Is that all right? So understand this. Many times when you have unmet needs, that can turn into desires that are unchecked. Simply stated, a need unmet can turn into a desire unchecked. 
when you have situations in your life where you did not get that love, where you did not get that connection at integral and important moments, sometimes you grow up in those desires that you might have. You don't even realize it. That may be from relationship to relationship to friendship to spouse, to whomever it is, that there are unhealthy characteristics that you're seeing in your life all do because there were needs that needed to be met when you were younger. Now, I want us to dive into some history and talk about this historical event that took place where someone, yes, they were abandoned, but they were able to live free. As a matter of fact, there was a guy by the name of Jacob. And this person, Jacob, he was a trickster. He was a little tricky fella, right? He, uh, as a matter of fact, he had a brother. And his brother, he used his brother in order for him to be uh, seen as the prominent one in their family. Jacob was the younger brother. And so according to culture at this time and Middle Eastern standards, according to the culture, it was the older brother that was supposed to get the first of everything. But he ended up being able to trick his father, who was in his older age, be able to trick his father so that his father would think that Jacob was the older brother and he was able to steal his brother's blessing. Now, at this time that we find ourselves in this, uh, this historical event, Jacob he isn't married yet, and uh, it's, it's time for him to look for, look for a spouse. And he's gone off to a far country. In, this country. in this country, he has some family members here. And he meets this lady at the local watering place for the sheep and for the animals. And now he does something that you know, by today's standards, would seem a little creepy, a little weird, right? So he meets this young lady. Her name is Rachel. And as he's coming up on Rachel, he's thinking to himself, man, she is so beautiful. So he helps her with, you know, watering the animals and stuff. And he kisses her, and then he cries, right? Now... <laughs> Now, just put yourself in that place, you know. That would be a little weird. But he loved this girl so much that he kissed her and he cried. And she did what any uh, sound mind individual would do and should have done. She ran and she told her father. <laughs> right? So, daughters, if you're in the room, you know, if y'all come, you know, give me. Right? So he does this, and the father comes and, uh, by the name of Laban, and he, uh, he welcomes Jacob in because they are our distant relatives. And so we'll see now, as Jacob is on this journey uh, to find a wife, to find a companion, what happens next. So if you would turn with me to Genesis chapter 29. And we'll begin at verses, or beginning at verse 15. If you have the City of Light Bible app, you can pull that up or you can check it out on the screen here. Beginning at verse 15, here's what it says. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my kinsmen, right, because we're related, you're my kinfolk. Should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Because he's saying, come on into the house. You know, you can stay here. You can work and whatever. Verse 16. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. And the name of the younger was Rachel. Verse 17 says this. <laughs> Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. So let me just break that, that down for a minute. 
Uh, some theologians believe that when it reads, uh, Leah's eyes were weak, that it was a kind of a local understanding, a local idiom, that it meant that uh, physically she kind of struggled a little bit, right? Um, also could have meant, meant by some theologians that she had some kind of uh, eye disorder or something like that. But to see it juxtaposed against Rachel being beautiful in form and appearance, we know that she was not physically attractive to Jacob, right? As a matter of fact, here is what Leah's name means. Leah's name means, in the Hebrew, weary. But there is also, uh, in the Akkadian language, which is also a Semitic language, you know, close to that area where they dwell, her name also meant cow, right? So I'm just, you know, leave that there for y'all to ponder. Verse 18. So Jacob loved Rachel. And he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Seven years. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. So stay with me, right? Let's do this. Verse 20 says, so Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. So we see that when somebody really loves you, they'll work for you. When somebody really loves you, they'll put some effort in, right? How many of y'all believe that? When somebody loves you, the work isn't an issue as long as they can be with you. Now, that's, that's love. So verse 21 says this. Then Jacob, and this is the seven years have passed. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her. For the time is completed. Y'all know what that means. It's the Bible. I say it. What's understood? Nothing have to be spoken. Verse 22. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. So during this time and in, in culture, big, huge wedding feasts. Verse 23. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. So we know that at these feasts, according to culture, there's, you know, alcohol, different things like that, too. So apparently he wasn't paying attention. Um, you know, the veil and all of that. Verse 24, Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant, to be, a, you know, to attend to her. Verse 25, and in the morning, somebody say in the morning. Behold, it was Leah, exclamation point. Behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, man, what did you do? Right? What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? So we understand that the trickster got tricked. Right? But... I don't, I don't know. I don't know where I would have been, you know, mentally in that situation. Seven years you worked, and then all of a sudden, you know, the rug pulled from under you. But Laban helped Jacob to understand that it's custom that, you know, the older daughter is supposed to be married first, and because of that, that's why he did that. But my thought is, Laban, you're being tricky because you could have told him that day one. Right? But he waited, he waited seven years. But so, uh, verse 30, after that, and Laban says, okay, you can have Rachel work for me for seven more years. <sighs> Jacob had it rough. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. Here's where the rejection piece is coming in. And served Laban for another seven years. Verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, 
He opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So here we have this situation where Leah is in a place of being rejected. Rejected by her father because he's like, you know, she got to get out of my house kind of thing. Rejected by the person that she is now married to. As the word said that she was hated. But because she was hated, God said, I'm going to have favor on you. Now, I want to encourage you here. Because for some of us, it's been that serious. Where we have been rejected to the point where people have literally hated us. And many times for no good reason. But I want to encourage you to know that although you might have been hated, although you might be in a weary place, you still have worth. As a matter of fact, encourage the person next to you because they need to know that. You might be weary, but you still have worth. Right? Your name might be Leah. You might be in the Leah situation. You might be weary eyed. You know? You might look like what you've been through. But even in the situation, you still have worth because God has not forgotten about you. And I thank God for that. So, verse. 32 says, and Leah conceived, and she bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. Hold on. In rejection sometimes, or situations in our past where we may have been dealing with abandonment. We're often moved or want to move to a place of where we want to do stuff in order to please people or in order to love people. We said this in the, the message, as a matter of fact, last week when we talked about toxic religion, that you do not have to do stuff in order for God to love you. Because you are you, God already loves you. And so here it's important for us to know. And I believe we're in a real place and I want to sit at this place for a moment. Here we find that Leah, due to wanting to be loved, she said, if I give him a child, then he will love me. Some of us are in situations today where we said, if I give them this, if I do this for them, then they're truly going to love me. Let me help you out here. There are some people that no matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter how many backflips, somersaults, air twists you turn, that they will still have that same mindset. So it's important for us to really know and understand the love that God has for us and to allow that to heal our rejection. Some of us have gotten caught up into habits that we know are destroying us because we want it to please someone or we want it to look a certain way in the eyes of people around us. And the enemy wants to use that thing to take you out prematurely so that you will never reach your purpose and you will never reach the people that God has ordained for you to reach. But I want to tell you today that God loves you and you do not have to perform in order for him to love you into your purpose. So she had this first child named Reuben because she said if I do this then he will love me we're going to see this progression of maturity that Leah takes 
And I, I pray today that we all here that are dealing with similar concerns and similar challenges, that God will mature us today. And she has her second son. And his name, according to verse 33, as we look, is Simeon. Verse 33 says this. So she conceived again because apparently having Reuben, it didn't work. Right? And for some of us today, we've realized that, hold on, I've done this. I've done all of these things, and it still hasn't worked. I'm still feeling empty. What's wrong? So she conceived and again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Because she figured that maybe since I'm able to do this, maybe because I'm able to produce children, and Rachel is not, then that means if I keep doing this, then he will love me. You know, for us today, there are certain skill sets that we have, certain abilities that naturally we're gifted at. And we figure that if we continue to operate in this gift that I have, then maybe the people will love me. You know, for some of you here, maybe your, your gift is, is speaking. Maybe your gift is the creative arts. And you figure that if I can just keep producing these, this artwork, if I could keep producing this music, if I could keep producing and building these things for people, that maybe they will love me because God gave me this ability. So maybe I should take this ability to try and please people. No. So we see at her second child, Simeon, she's still dealing with being hated in her own household. Now, I had to step back for a moment, and I had to, to look at the situation. I said, you know, it's a lot of talk about Leah, you know, he, she's hated, but he still got her popping out these babies, so. <laughs> I'm, I'm, just think, I'm just thinking, like, <laughs> you might be hated, but you can produce, right? And so she getting some kind of attention, right? So third child, <laughs> the third child now verse 34 again she conceived and bore a son and said now this time my husband will be attached to me been there because I have borne him three sons therefore his name will be called Levi so now we're at number three and to understand a little bit about uh, biblical numbers, numbers are significant, right? And now this number three in particular, we find it uh, Old Testament, New Testament in strong places. Not only is it the number of uh, the Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not only is it uh, representative of Jesus who was in the grave and rose on the third day, so many different uh, times we find this number three. And in this particular situation, we see that the number three represents harmony and completeness. So she's gotten to a place of where she's starting personally to get to a place of being complete and solid. She's getting to this place. She's not totally there yet. But it began to make me think and understand that as we continue to produce for people and continue to give people all our all and what the, the scriptures say, casting our pearls before swine many times, casting our pearls and doing what we know is the best for us and giving it to people who don't care. 
Sometimes we have to step back and, and say, you know what? My completeness and my strength, I'm not going to keep giving this away to somebody who isn't appreciative of what's going on, right? There has to be a point. Because after a certain time, and I know people say, you know, you just keep on going and keep on. If the Lord tells you to. But for some of us, you're tired and you're weary because you're giving out all of your energy. And God hadn't told you to do that. He hadn't told you to do that. But because you have the ability, because you have a gifting to do it, you feel like it must be okay. And you're draining your very life and not focused on the actual purpose that God has intended you for. And so some of us in here, and I'm going to say it, some of us in here, you got to reevaluate some of the relationships that you're in. You got to reevaluate and say, hold on, is this God speaking to me? Or is this some of my abandonment and rejection issues? And do I continue to perform and reproduce and pour out all of my energy because I'm operating just like those little kids that were institutionalized and are trying to be overtly and overly friendly because I'm trying to go after and grab and grasp after love that someone has already made up in their mind they're not going to give me. And so if we, if God has given us an ability to think through, and I believe in this atmosphere, in this, in this, this time today, we're going to begin to see some clarity on some of the relationships that we are in and be able to say that, hold on now, this isn't God. And if I continue to stay in this, then I am becoming an enabler. And in this, at the same time, I'm being unhealthy too. And so maybe, just maybe, because we're in February, it's the month of love, and I'm trying to keep y'all before y'all get to Valentine's Day, spending all this money. And this person is going to be the, the exact same after that night than they were February 13th. Trying to help you. <laughs> so maybe, just maybe, God is calling you to push pause and say, you know what, let me get healthy because I realize in all honesty, I realize that there is a gaping hole in my heart that I keep trying to force fill it with relationships that will never produce wholeness. Maybe just maybe God is calling you to a place of healing in this season, of focused healing. Because the distraction of continuously pouring out, God is saying, save that strength. I've got something that I want you to do. I've got something greater for you. And so we go on. And in verse... 35, we find this at her fourth child. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Said this time, which denotes that the previous times she was focused on pleasing him and praising him and pouring out all of her gifts and her strength to him. But this time, I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. She said, I'm good for right now. I'll holler. Just give me a minute. <laughs> 
And we know according to the historical record that she bore more sons later. But seeing this progression of her life, we see that she made it to a place of being whole first. And when she made it to a place of being whole, she didn't have to continue to reproduce and reproduce and spill out her strength. Because she realized that if I'm whole in you, God, then I'm okay. Overcoming abandonment. There are a couple of key pieces here. The first one is this. Acknowledge that you have been emotionally wounded. You have to say that, you know what? I acknowledge that I've got something in me that, that isn't, isn't. I've got something in me that I need healing for. And this person or this situation or this environment right now is not healthy because it's not a healing environment. It's the first thing. I'll give you the scripture on it and we won't, won't read all the way through it, but Psalm 22, verses 1 through 5. If you're taking notes, and I believe that we are a note-taking church. Psalm 22, 1 through 5, and here's what we see. The, the writer of this psalm or song is, is pouring out their heart to God. For a few of us in here, you haven't really poured out your heart in honesty in a long time. You might have done a, a little bit of complaining and a little of the blame game where you're blaming somebody else. But the first point, if you are going to see healing, is to acknowledge that, God, it's me. Here is where I need the application of your healing virtue in my life. It's here. It's right here. It's not their fault. It's not that other person's fault. It's not my job's fault. It's not my spouse's fault. It's not my, my boyfriend, my girlfriend's fault. But, God, it's inside of me where I need help and I'm crying out to you. The second, ask how you got there. How did I get here? How did I get here? Many times, and some of you all may have heard this, it's not where you've fallen, it's where you tripped. Where was the place where, way back when where I decided in my mind that it was okay to chase after people, to chase after people instead of chasing after the healing that I needed from God? And I believe that the Holy Spirit today, because we're going to be praying in a moment. So team, yep, we're going to be praying in a moment. But it's important for us to apply and allow God to apply the healing to the root of the issue, not to the symptoms. Because the symptoms are just an outward showing of an inward root problem. How did I get here? And the third is this. After you have allowed God to show you where that place is. You can begin to put your suffering to constructive use. There's someone else that needs to hear your story. There is someone else that is out here suffering, who is weary, who is giving up all of their strength in efforts that will never reciprocate but they need to know that you met a man named Jesus he told you all about your life you took your troubles to him 
and he healed you. And that because of that, you can be healed too. I want to say this about Leah, and we're going to pray. Her situation, although she went through years of being hated, she didn't realize then, but her struggle and her challenges that she were, was going through in her life, it popped up in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it says this. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. So to connect those points here, we understand this, that although she went through ridicule, although she went through being hated, the son that she had for Jacob ended up being the ancestor of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what you are going through right now, yes, you don't all understand it. Yes, you don't have all of the answers. But you have to trust in the God that knows and sees eternity. That he's going to work the situation together for your good. Romans 8 and 28, one of my favorite scriptures, says, and my God, says, and my God, we know that he's going to work all things together for good. So even in your trial, even in your heartache, even in your weariness, God is perfectly able, ready, and capable to work it together for your good. What you're going through right now, God wants to use it for his glory. And so that we can bless somebody else last scripture John 14 18 which is the foundational scripture for this message series Jesus was speaking to his disciples and as he was preparing to be crucified a little while later after this he said this simple verse 14 18 I will not leave you orphans I will come to you. This series is entitled Ghosted, which is a play on words. Because you see, although we understand current language of ghosted to mean somebody who stopped communicating with you, somebody who abandoned you, somebody who rejected you, we know that God is capable to allow the Holy Spirit to heal your heart. So I thank God that although I might have been hurting, I thank God that although I might have been going through, that I've been ghosted. That the Holy Ghost, that the Holy Spirit has healed my heart, has made me new. If that's you today and you want to be renewed and you want to be healed from the hurt and the pain of rejection, I want to see you here at this altar. I want to see you here at this altar. And I believe, as y'all putting y'all hands together, thanking the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Still coming.
Father. Why don't we just lift our hands as a sign of surrender? God, we come to you today. Some of us weary. Some of us torn down. Some of us barely making it here today. But God, we're here at your altar. The altar is representative of a place of sacrifice, a place of laying it all down. And God, we lay it all down. We lay it all down. We lay it all down before you. Right now, we pray, God, that as we lay everything down for you right now, that you will help us, God, to receive from you. God, as we sit here and stand here in your presence, we pray, Father, that you would minister to our hearts, minister to our needs. There is no one like you, and we know because we have tried people. We have tried other ones. We have tried to expend our resources and try to expend our life so that others would love us. But God, we acknowledge that right now here in your house is where we find hope. We pray, Father, also that you would show us, show us, Holy Spirit, not where we fail, but where we trip, because we are intimately knowledgeable of where we trip. God, show us where we've fallen, but show us where we trip. God, show us the root issue. Why is it that we feel like we need to search after and draw after and grasp after other people's love? God, when everything that we need is found in you. So today, today we lay it down before you. You promise that you are near to the broken spirit and save as such that beat of a contrite heart, a contrite heart and a contrite spirit, you would in no wise cast away. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for healing right now. And God, even as you are showing us that root, we lay it down before you. And we pray that you would fill us up with your love. Fill us up with your confidence. Fill us up with your strength. And God, give us direction on what our next steps are so that we can live in a place of wholeness, so that we can live in a place of victory in you. God, we thank you for doing it. We thank you that you are the God that heals us. You, we thank you that you are the God that heals us. And we bless you today, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Understand that it's worth it. 
God doesn't want you expending your years and your life on worthless pursuits, but he wants to shine through you. He wants to shine through you and see his glory be revealed through your life. So here's the, the next step for us, because each week we have a practical next step. In two weeks, our small group Bible studies are starting again. We're starting our next semester. So if you have a problem with remembering links, you can go ahead and get your cell phone out and take a picture. But we are a church that leans into Bible study, into doing community and life with one another. There's multiple nights that you can choose from. Let's get in a group. Let's see God, how he will heal us week after week after week and set us in a place where we can see his glory shine through us. Is that all right? I said, is that all right? Amen. Amen. So bless you all. I thank God for what he is doing in our lives.